everyone. My name is David McLeod, and I am your Life Mastery Coach and author of the wonderful little book, A Life to Die For. I'm also one of the co-authors in the best-selling series, The Wellness Universe Guide to Complete Self-Care. Sorry, we're a little late this morning. Uh, we got off to a bit of a rocky start with technology being kind of mishmashy today. <laughs> Both Linda and I had some technical problems that we're dealing with. Anyway, just want to say welcome to Life Mastery TV, your source for inspiration, empowerment, and fulfillment. This is episode 238, and our title today is Journey to Self-Knowing. Now, Life Mastery is all about identifying and celebrating tools and ideas for improving our lives. Well, my friend Linda Marsanico has published a book called The A-Train to Sedona, which chronicles her personal journey of spiritual awakening and self-discovery and invites readers along as companions on her passage towards greater self-awareness, intuition, and connection to the divine. Through vivid storytelling, Linda recounts her process of letting go of limiting beliefs, embracing multidimensional thinking, and developing a heart-centered inner language. Her memoir traces her path of opening up to compassion, forgiveness, and unconditional self-love, all key ingredients of a life of joy and fulfillment. This wonderful book serves not only as a map of Linda's process, but also as a guide for readers on their own individual journeys. Within the pages of this book, there are many practical tools for well-being, including harnessing the power of love, stillness, and prayer to achieve balance and enhance personal healing. So for today's episode of Life Mastery TV, Linda joins me once again to discuss her book and to share, all, share with all of us some of the wonderful gifts she has learned during her program. So please welcome Linda Marsanico back to the show. Welcome, Linda. You can share your camera. Come on and let's get to see that beautiful face of yours. Here I am. <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> it's going to be perfect. And uh, thank you for your persistence. Can you just do me a little favor? Can you maybe tilt your camera down a little bit so we see more of you and less of the background? Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Thank. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you very much. So welcome again. This is the second time you've been on the show. I think the last time was a little over a year ago when you were yes. just in the process of, of finishing up this book and getting it out to the people. And so now we're going to talk about it in more detail and, uh, and learn more about you and about your journey. And I'm pretty excited about that. I'm excited too, David. The process of writing the book was a very long one. It's like birthing a baby. I have three children. This is my fourth baby. <laughs> and well, I, I guess if, if, if it's like birthing a baby, then I can claim to be a mother too, because I've also written a book and I know exactly what you mean. It is a challenging, time-consuming labor of love. Uh, and it, it truly is. I can't speak for you, but for me, it was well worth the journey. What do you think? Absolutely. I'm a different person having published the book. It went through many revisions. And this mm -hmm. recent one that is now published is by far the most beautiful version. I had someone working with me telling me, Linda, tell stories, bring your readers in, connect with them. And he, he pulled it out of me. And, and so the stories are there. And someone said, you have really some good stories in your book. Yeah, that's right. I, and that's a really very powerful point to make. And uh, one of the things that I have learned in my own journey in, in participating in multiple uh, book collaborations, the story is what really draws people in. You can, you can tell people what you've learned and they might listen, they might not. But when you put mm -hmm. it in the form of a story and say, hey, this is what happened to me and this is what I learned as a result of that, it's the this is what happened to me part that people relate to. They say, yes. oh yeah, I had that happen too. Or my brother or my sister or somebody had that happen. So I'm familiar with what you're talking about. That's a powerful, powerful thing, you know? Yes, and it gives people hope. When I, when I read someone else's writing and they share something that has happened to me, I feel connected and I feel hopeful. Oh, I'm not right. alone. Somebody else has experienced this and they've, they're in the process of resolving it or they've resolved it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I remember working with uh, a man named Sean Stevenson. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He was a, a man with a 
with a he he was a coach, but he was a man who had a disease that made him uh, age very quickly, and he had real real spine problems. He was a very very small person. He was maybe at best two and a half feet tall, Ooh. but he had um, just an amazing ability to tell stories and to um, and to share things. And one of the things that he he taught me that uh, I, I'm going to share this with you and for all of our listeners. The more personal the story, the more universal the impact. Mm -hmm. And at first I didn't understand what he meant, you know, but it wasn't until I started paying attention to the stories of other people and realizing, yeah, when I resonate with the story, all of a sudden yeah. that impact just, it just magnifies. So yeah, beautiful. I'm glad that you got into that, that mindset of writing stories. And I have to say, you know, I have your book here and I just forgot to bring it to the, to the table here today. But I have read your book, and uh, and it is a delightful piece of work, I have to say, with lots of Thanks. great um, great wisdom, great stories, as you say, and uh, and well worth the time and energy. So I, I want to ask you something. What was it that led you to the place where you felt that it was important for you to write this book? So, David, I'm a New Yorker. When 9-11 happened, I felt bereft. And I joined a local food co-op. Why? Because I wanted to be part of something bigger than I am and more collaborative. Mm -hmm. And around that time, I joined a spiritual group with a clairvoyant healer and we met weekly to chant and to meditate. And there were men and women, but mostly women. And they talked about concepts I had never heard before. It was like I was speaking Chinese and they were speaking Greek. Right. And so I read the metaphysical literature and I read, I was ravenous to read. And at that time, I also had some counseling. I had healings every three weeks or so. And I had this experience and I wanted to share the experience. I, the title is the A train to Sedona. And in New York City, the A train is the express train. Mm -hmm. I'd like to help my readers get on the express train because I was on the local and that meandered. And I know that that was part of my incarnation, but I'm here to inspire others on their path. And of course, also, I wanted my voice to be heard. Yeah. And well, I mean, 9-11 was a, I mean, a, a massive, massive turning point for everybody, uh, certainly in the U.S. and probably throughout the world. Um, and I can certainly understand it, especially if you lived in New York at the time, I, I can't imagine what that would have been like. Uh, I was very fortunate to be quite a ways away from it, but nevertheless, I have to say that the emotional impact was, was pretty intense. Something that really kind of, it surprised me how much impact it had on me. So I can totally resonate with that. Yeah. I'm still a member of the food co-op. And I, I love the collaboration and that it's like a United Nations of people. Mm -hmm. We work together, we have great food. So I like collaboration and I'm working more to collaborate. Also, Sedona, and on the cover of the book is a picture of Cathedral Rock, one of the most beautiful vortexes. And I remember the first time I went to Sedona, was in 2001, just after hmm. the, the bombing. I think it was just after. Yes, it would have to have been. It was actually 2002 that I went. And the hmm. Red Rocks are a sight to be seen. You meditate on them hmm. and reach depth and are lifted. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing experience of beauty and self-knowing. Talk about self-knowing. Being on retreats there twice a year, the gals and, and me were just forever growing in, in getting to know ourselves. And, and in that energy, it really picks it up. Sure. You yeah. are going to learn more and go more deeply. In First of all, it's 4,000 miles high. And then the vortex uh, 4, energy 4,000 feet high. What did I say? 4,000 miles. I would say that's a pretty tall mountain. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the correction. It goes to show you how much I 
so it's very interesting that I would say that from my unconscious, because yeah, yeah. that would make it lift. If we, we would think of the fifth dimension being up, and I don't know that it is just up, it's maybe everywhere, who knows? Right, it's, uh, it's yeah. It would, be four, it would be all those miles, like my, my child would then say, it's four miles high. <laughs> right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, so I know that I've been to Sedona a couple of times myself, and I do, I do agree with you. It's, it's a, an amazing place. It's, it's exquisitely beautiful, uh, and it, there is a definite a shift in energy that happens when, well, certainly when I go there. And, um, and now I understand that, as what, from reading your book, I'm, I don't want to give this away, but you bought a house there. Is I that did right? for 13 years. Yeah, I was I was a homeowner for 13 years and I just sold it about a year and a half ago to simplify my life because going there from New York, uh, it's a five hour flight, uh, doing it twice a year. I was going a lot since the house was there Four out five hours on the plane, uh, then getting to the airport, renting a car. It, it was a lot on a steady basis. So I thought, let me uh, simplify and visit as a, a guest and visit my friends and uh, mm -hmm. like that. Beautiful. Yeah. And so you're still going to Sedona periodically, but perhaps not as frequently as before. That's right. I plan to do some book touring, uh, crystal magic, uh, which is the most significant bookstore in Sedona has my book. And mm -hmm. I'm talking with a couple of other cafes and another bookstore, and I'm hoping to get the book in there. And once the book is kind of situated, I'm thinking of going and promoting it. Well, good for you. I'm looking for yeah, yeah. And and doing it by yourself is a challenge for sure. It's, uh, yeah, promoting a book is not a trivial thing to do, and it takes a lot of time and energy. So why don't you share with us, now you've already shared a little bit about how you came to the place of wanting to write the book, but why don't you share a little bit about what you feel was Give me, give me three or four of the most important things you inserted into that book that you think the readers would get the most benefit from. Well, first, well, I have the tips and I'll get to the tips in a moment because I wrote the book and then I, I went back and I thought, what can I pull up to be a guidepost? There's my four stage model for working with clients and we can also work on our own. The first uh, goal is to know what we're thinking. Because if thoughts are rumbling around in our mind and we don't know, it's problematic. I can step back and, and think, oh, I'm thinking this. It's, it's pretty negative. And I can shift that. Mm -hmm. I can start to gracefully replace the negative thinking with affirmations, with loving thoughts. The second goal is to know our habitual behavioral response. If something continues to happen to me and I respond with anger or tears and I don't want to do that, I could also step back and plan how I wish to respond in a calm way, in a relaxed way, and implement that when it comes up. Right. The next is the roots, are the roots of behavior. Going to childhood, mm -hmm. understand the influence, not dwelling there, but just understanding what is affecting me. Right. And then using the fourth is using meditation mantra. And I would add prayer. In the book, I have meditation mantra, but of course, prayer is so important. And then another one is to let go of what doesn't serve us. Now, in all of these, in this plan, it's a way to, and I write about this, change the software program in our brain. We're shifting our thoughts, we're shifting our habitual behavioral response, we're getting to know the roots of behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's the way to shift that so that we can design the way we want our life to look. Because we're right. now, we're no longer powerless as we were as a child, we are powerful. And we have mm -hmm. many skills that we can bring to bring our life to a positive place. Right, right. So knowing what you're thinking and then making a decision about how you want to interact with those thoughts, uh, habitual behaviors, the, uh, and then the idea of meditation. And I missed one in there. Um, 
So it's um, the first one is knowing what our thoughts are. Right. Because they roll around and they can be quite negative. And we want sure. to bring them to full consciousness. Uh, right. Knowing what the habitual behavioral response is. The oh, right. And then the, going to the roots. And then going the to roots. the roots of it. Yeah. Yes. And right. then right. meditation mantra. And then something I talk about is letting go of what doesn't serve us. Right. Uh, now, also the tips. Uh, there are 12 well, of let, them. Let, hold on. Before we go there, we'll get there. Yeah. Don't worry. We got lots of time here. I just... Uh, so the idea of thoughts, the first thing I, I just wanted to, to say, we have, scientifically, we, ha we know that people have a thought every one to two to three seconds. So if you think about how many seconds there are in a day, there are 84,600 seconds in a day. And that means you have a lot of thoughts. Now, here's what's also interesting. If you think about that in terms of a lifetime, you have millions billions of thoughts over the course mm -hmm. of a lifetime yes but here's what's really interesting and something that i had never thought about before obviously when you're a little baby your thoughts are theoretically brand new to your awareness these are thoughts you've never had before but as you get older more and more and more of your thoughts are just repetitions of what happened before so eventually by the time you reach your 40s your 50s your 60s 70 to 80 percent of your thoughts are just repetitions and and as you say most of those it, it, it's unfortunately a, a fact of life most of your thoughts are indeed negative thoughts and most of them are thoughts pointed towards ourselves i'm yes. i'm not good enough i'm not this I, i'm i you know i can't do this or stuff like that and so you're absolutely right being bringing awareness to what we think is absolutely critical you know it's and, critical um, to self love david because absolutely. the idea is to love ourselves i've told my clients what i want for you is for you to love yourself exactly yeah and so you know i know you've got tips and tools and stuff like that <clears throat> one of the things that i do with my clients is i encourage them to to, to do what i call a, a, a process of radical self-acceptance and the way I teach them that, I said, I want you to write two lists. And on the first list, I want you to write down every positive thing you can think about yourself, what you love about yourself, what you really, really are crazy about. And people usually, you know, they have a pretty, who, who knows, you have a list as, as long as it is. And then I say, okay, now on a separate piece of paper, I want you to write down all the things that you believe are wrong with you. In all, write down all the things that you think you cannot do or you're, you're no good or whatever. And then I say, great, now you've got two lists. And I'm pretty sure for most people, that second list is longer than the first list. How do we fix that? So what I ask my clients to do is look at every single item on that second list and ask yourself this question. Give me two examples where this thing has actually done me some good in life. Find two ways that this actually serves me. Now, just to give you a simple example, one of the things that came up on my list is sometimes I think of myself as arrogant. And I know, I know where that comes from. I, I've done my own child stuff. But I look at arrogance and I think, well, that's, everybody thinks arrogance is a bad thing. But what is it really? Well, it means that sometimes I have this belief that I know more than other people around me. Well, guess what? Sometimes that's true. And maybe I need to learn how to embrace what I do know rather than thinking it's bad to express what I do know. So that's one way I can I can shift that and make it a positive. The other way is being arrogant is kind of maybe a little bit of overconfidence. But what's wrong with confidence? Nothing. So you see, I can now draw out the I do know stuff because I am smart and I am confident. Two positive mm -hmm. things which I now put on my first list. Mm -hmm. And I do that for every single thing on my negative list. And before you know it, you've got a positive list that's longer than the negative list. And this is something I call this hyper listing because that's what it is. And I, I do this with people all the time. And I, invariably, people come and say, wow, that is that is amazing. And it's so simple. So it you talked about. Freeing. It sounds yeah, freeing. Yeah. 
It is. And you talked about letting go of what doesn't serve us. Well, that's mm -hmm. a great question too. How does this serve me? Mm -hmm. How does it serve me to have this belief? Because I've, I've got this belief and I've had it for quite a while. Well, how does it serve me? Yeah. And, and it does serve me in some way. Otherwise, I wouldn't be hanging on to it. So that's part of the process that you were talking about. And maybe going back to the roots of our, of yes. our behavior and trying to understand, well, where did this come from? You know, not to make mommy and daddy wrong or anything like that, but just to say, where did this come from? I think it's important. So it's it's to really, this. really wonderful that you have these four, pla these four basic steps and mm -hmm. you encourage people to do those. Yes. Uh, also in with the roots of behavior and looking inward, stepping back. As I interact with others, because that's another one of the items we thought we'd talk about today. If I'm interacting with someone, I can have a reaction. And instead of blaming someone else for the perhaps negative interaction, I can ask myself in the mirror, in the uh, metaphorical mirror, what can I learn about myself? What Beautiful. does this yeah. say about me? And this is the idea of partnering, because as I ask the questions, uh, because the journey is an inward journey, a journey toward the core of love where creator exists. And so with that sense of responsibility, I go inward and I get to know myself and getting to know myself allows me to love myself. I don't have to be afraid of what I might uncover or how I might do something because I know more about who I am. There's right. less distraction, there's more peace. Yeah. And self-love is important for compassion. And it's funny, I had talked with someone about assertion and compassion, and she said, how do those go together? <laughs> assertion, by definition, is getting my needs met while respecting the rights of others. In assertion, I announce who I am, I become real and it diffuses anger. It breaks it up because I can practice being assertive. And sometimes when I practice, I'm not as gentle as I might wish to be. I might be a little, the tone might not be right, but we're always practicing, but it's respecting the rights of others. And of course, sometimes when I ask, I may not get what I want. That's and, right. yep. and so the beauty, though, is that I've stated what it is. My voice is heard. It's not something confined, uh, which leads to uh, negative feelings about the self. Now, there was a very funny story in the book. I wanted to go to Sedona with my Sedona group on Father's Day. And we're a very close family. And I loved my father is deceased now, but I loved him so much. And I wanted to go to Sedona, like 50 50. I wanted, but I really wanted to go to Sedona. How would I tell him? Oh my goodness. So I remember I was on my, my sister's grill uh, uh, on her deck and we we're grilling food. And my father and I were alone. And I blurted out, Dad, I'm going to Sedona on Father's Day and I can't be with you. And he said, Oh, there's always somebody missing. <laughs> <laughs> which was like comic relief <laughs> right 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 yeah you know there's there's so much that you've said here that, that just really resonates for me one one of the things that i wanted to point out is uh you talk about going within going within and one thing that i have noticed and maybe you've had this experience too the more i go in the more expansion seems to happen yes it's it's like when when you say the word expansion, you think of this, it's going outwards. But in reality, the more I go in, the more expansion happens. It's a, it's a counterintuitive uh, concept that mm. I didn't really understand un until I started doing a lot of meditation. And now it's like, wow, I love going within. It's the most exciting place to be. It's That's where all ultimate wisdom, truth, divinity, <clears throat> all those beautiful things and and unconditional love resides within yes and we can tap into it anytime we want to yes. you know 
Yes, indeed. The other thing I wanted to say is you mentioned that uh, assertion is about making stating your wants and needs without uh, and while paying attention and respecting the needs of others. And I agree with that 100%. One thing that I have learned in my life is I may not always get what I want when I assert myself, but I'm almost certainly not going to get my what I want when I don't assert myself. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. And as I mentioned, when we don't say what we need to, if we continue to not speak up, it stays confined and it leads to negative self-affect, just a negative feeling about Absolutely. self. Yeah. My, the, her, the first 40 years of my life were like that. I had this belief that I was supposed to, to do what everybody else wanted. I had this belief that everybody knew me better than I knew myself. I had this belief that my wants and needs were only going to be answered by someone outside of myself. It was a, a belief that started when I was about three years old and it just grew and magnified. And here I was, you know, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, trying to live up to that belief system. And I was absolutely mi miserable. Oh. You know, any idea of, of, of happiness and joy was like, that was, somebody else gets that. Oh. I, on the other hand, had resentment and anger. That's what I got to experience because mm -hmm. of that choice. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I didn't know that when it happened when I was 40 years old. It was several years later when I got into my 50s that I started doing this work that you're talking about, going within, finding the roots, looking at the, at the history. And I finally traced that whole thing back to something my mother said to me when I was three years old. She was, she was upset because I wasn't behaving the way she wanted me to. You know, and she she put me up on a, on a changing table. And she said, "Listen, young man, I'm your mother. You're supposed to listen to me." And 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 you know, she's kind of flustered, and she finally blurts out, "I know you better than you know yourself." Now, of course, at forty, I had no recollection of that. It took a lot of therapy and deep work before I found that piece of information. Now I know my mom didn't really mean it. Mm -hmm. She wasn't trying to be mean or angry or abusive or anything. She was frustrated, you know, and uh, but isn't it amazing how a, just one little phrase like that can impact a life for 40 years? Oof, it's powerful, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And I share that story because I know the people who listen to this program and to listen to anything I have to say have gone through similar things. Mm -hmm. Your mom may not have said, I know you better than you know yourself, but I guarantee your mom or your dad said something to you that created a belief system within you mm -hmm. and it started you on a path. And what happens is if at three, it, it becomes unconscious because that's what happens right. to many things when we're three and deep work that's necessary is as necessary and essential to uncover so that we can let go and, and be who we can be. Right. Yeah. And how many of us, I can't tell you how many people I know who have, have, have used the phrase people pleaser to describe themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like society insists that that's what we become people pleasers. We got to put mm -hmm. everybody else's wants and needs ahead of our own and, and be absolutely compliant and, and complacent and, acquiescent to everybody else, you know, it, it, it's no wonder our world is so messed up. It really is. I think a lot of children learn that in childhood, as yep. you mentioned, um, not to be assertive, to be quiet and to take the lead from others. That's right. Yeah. And, and so parents who are doing their best to try and raise good kids and want them to behave and so forth, they think they're doing their kids a favor. And on some level they are, they're teaching them discipline, but at the same time, they may be inadvertently building this wall around the kid that keeps them from the self-love that allows them to blossom into the amazing human beings that they really were meant to be. Yes. I think being a parent is the most challenging job we have. <laughs> and I think that uh, when I think of my children, uh, I think of raising them and raising them so that they can take off and become the butterfly. Right. You know, the cocoon is there and then you don't want to crush those wings. You want them to 
to leave you. You raise That's them right. to leave you. Is, and when they leave you, you know you're successful. That's uh, right. Yeah. And yet, I mean, I know in my own life, because of what I went through in that early, early stage, by the time I was in my 40s, I had three kids. And I can tell you, I mean, in many ways, I was a good father. I know that. But I also had some of this baggage that I was carrying around, and it impacted those kids as well. And so, you know, when I finally had my wake-up call, I think I was 40, 42 years old at the time, I, um, I realized there was no way I could stay in that situation. I had to leave. That was, everything was telling me, get out of here. And uh, I eventually did make that separation. So I had to somehow maintain a relationship with my kids from a distance and, mm -hmm. and just keep telling them over and over again, this is not your fault. This is not about you. I did this because I needed to take care of myself. Yes. And, and my two sons, they were the younger two of the children. They, they've done their own, a lot of their own personal growth work. And we've done a lot of healing work together. My daughter, I wish I could say I had the same kind of result with her. She was older, and I think she's a lot more angry at me these days. So we are kind of estranged at the moment. And this happens, you know? So I have to leave her to find her own way. I just keep sending love her way and saying, look, I, 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 don't, I don't communicate with her because it's just not feasible. But I do send energetic waves of love to her every day, all the time. And hope that that somehow it lands and she comes around and decides that maybe it's time to have a relationship with my father. I, that's all I can hope for. So. What I love to do when I don't have um, communication with someone directly is to send love from my higher self to their higher self. It's right. a beautiful way to, it's just love. It's just love. Love is everything. Love is awesome. Uh, yeah. From my higher self uh, to them, to their higher right. self. Yeah. Well, this is this is really, really beautiful conversation. I'm just really enjoying it. Why don't you talk a little bit more about this dichotomy that you described earlier between assertion and compassion? I mean, I know they're not really dichotomous uh, uh, concepts, but help me understand how it is you share that with your your clients and with the people that you work with. I think a lot of us, I know that I had to do a lot of work on assertion. And I see what I see tells me that people need to do work with that skill. Mm -hmm. And it has sort of a bad rap. And I want to give it a good rap. And I fit it into compassion because in order to be compassionate, I need to love myself and I need to have compassion for myself. Mm -hmm. It brings me to this, all you need is love. And that I think that love and compassion are soul sisters. So look at the song by the Beatles, all you need is love. Simple. And then you listen to the song. Uh, it starts with the French national anthem, asymmetrical signatures, the, two of the uh, Rolling Stones clapping their hands. It's all chaotic. And then they end with in the mood. It's chaos, chaos, chaos. And I thought to myself, it's simplicity grounded in the elaborate so in order for us to get to all you need is love there's a lot of work to be done is what i want to say and if we bring that work to and call it an adventure like what's going to happen today what am i what is creator going to send me today mm -hmm. it, it can become more of a joy than a slog yeah, right. So we, right. So we need love. We need to love ourselves. And that is a major undertaking. We have negative uh, affect that we've taken in messages from childhood. And so one of my tips is to be having to have an intention to be on the spiritual path to say, I'm more than my skin and bones. I'm an eternal spiritual being and I'm moving toward creator, which is really inward. Okay, I'm moving mm -hmm. toward later. And then to have a sense of responsibility for my actions. I'm not going to blame Joan and John and, and Sheila. I have to say, well, what does this say about me? What can right. I learn? Mm -hmm. And then I need to look at my thoughts and say, well, let me step back. 
what are they? Do I like them? If I don't, I change them. This is a lot of work already. <laughs> and then we have prayer and meditation. We have developing the ego and it goes on. So to be compassionate is like this beautiful, I don't know, a beautiful circle sun. And we want to add to it because every day we're making decisions on whether to be compassionate or angry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If someone says something to me, it's, I perceive it as hurtful. Rather than lash out, I can say something kind. So my cousin told me she was in the supermarket and a woman was with her cart and my cousin bumped into her and the, the woman said something fresh to my cousin. And my cousin said, I'm so sorry. And it melted the woman. She just melted with the love that came from my cousin. Mm -hmm. So there was a compassionate interaction. She could have said something nasty and they would have been in a tiff. And then we get a ripple effect. Anger, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anger, and it goes out to everybody. Remember, we're broadcast journalists. Right. Every thought, every action, every feeling is going out. And when you're happier, David, I'm going to be happier. When I'm happier, you're going to be happier. We're all yeah. in this together. Right. And we all are headed, whether it's this lifetime or subsequent ones, we're headed toward compassion. Right. That's the goal. That's the creator's goal for us. This is what I believe. The, the goal is that. So it also reminds me of Neil Donald Walsh in Conversations with God. And he says, God, I, I don't want to do this. And God says, Neil, take 10,000 lifetimes. And Neil says, oh, I think I want to do it now. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's it, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I mean, I think I think of compassion a little differently than you do. Um, to me, compassion is, I mean, it certainly emanates out of love. I agree with that. I think that compassion is, is a form of empathy that also has a desire to reduce suffering. That's how I, that's how I describe it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, it's one thing to feel empathy with a person, which is different from sympathy, but it's, it's another thing to ha have compassion because part mm -hmm. of what I, what I, when I when I'm experiencing this 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 visceral visceral sense of compassion, if I see you suffering, a big part of me wants to do something to stop that suffering. And here's one of the challenges that many of us face: is at what point do I step in and stop the suffering? You know, if you're actually in a life-threatening situation, then obviously I'm going to react and do something right yeah. now. But if you're just going through some some you know emotional pain maybe i need to just kind of be with you and observe and say okay what support would you like from me rather than jumping in and yes. you know giving a hug or something i mean often if i if i touch you while you're in the middle of your pain i can take you right out of that and that pain is exactly what you needed to heal mm -hmm. so sometimes we've got to be really really careful about allowing our compassion to drive us into something that that can actually take someone out of their very important experience. Mm -hmm. So I can feel compassion as long, whenever I have that sense of empathy and the desire to reduce suffering, if those two elements are together, then I, I believe that's kind of, that's my experience of compassion. Mm -hmm. But I don't actually have to act. I don't have to do something right away. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's part of the, the growth pattern. I know this, that I've been in many workshops now where I've actually learned to be with people who are crying, going through deep emotional uh, release. And my natural desire was just to reach out and just comfort them, you know. And I, I, it, was, it took a practice for me to step back and just wait. Yeah. And notice all of a sudden that, that energy dissipates and then joy and love starts to come mm -hmm. in to replace it. Yeah. So compassion might be something about just being present and not necessarily doing anything. I think it has that aspect. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, it's just been my experience. Um, but I agree that, that compassion is important and self-compassion is the most important of all, you know, because I have to be compassionate with myself. 
And I also believe that if I'm going to learn how to forgive, I have to start with compassion. This is something that I've also, I mean, it, it just, it didn't seem obvious to me, but every time I wanted to forgive someone, I had my old ego mind come up and say, well, if you forgive, that means you're, you're saying that what he or she did was okay. And I, I had a hard time getting through that. But when I started to feel some compassion for the person, mm -hmm. trying to understand what he or she was going through, then the forgiveness came a whole lot easier. And I was able to release that crazy ego mind desire to get even or, you know, yeah. look for justice or whatever it was. I think that forgiveness is complex and it needs to be thought of as a process, as you described. Mm -hmm. uh, we yep. can't just say forgive we we can say well i'm i'm working on it and all i'm working on is in the service of forgiveness but i'm not there yet we have <laughs> yeah. to honor what we feel uh, exactly yeah and and yeah we can have a whole conversation about forgiveness it's a it's a powerful powerful force one of the most powerful forces in the universe uh it's definitely a very active form of love that's for sure mm -hmm. and yes. uh i know that i know now that the more I forgive, the less I, the less angst and anger and resentment and everything else that I feel in my life. And forgiveness is not really about the other person anyway. The other person doesn't even have to know I have forgiven mm -hmm. him or her. It's about me. It's about yes. releasing all that stuff, which is what you talked about at the beginning. Yeah. No, forgiveness is an important concept an important feeling when we're ready to do that and it you know when we let go of these distractions we're more clear and we can be more creative and more compassionate mm -hmm. clearing away all the distractions to remembering who we really are bingo yeah we're parts of creator that's right and so, um but we get distracted. So the idea is to clear the, the field so that we can see and know and create. Yeah. Love and be and the things that humans are capable of. That's our potential. Right. Yeah. One of the great, you, you mentioned conversations with God. One of my favorite um, I mean, I've read all of Don, Neil Donald Walsh's books and yes, I listened to. to many of them on audio book format too. Uh, and I, I, I think I will, I will say that I credit Neil Donald Walsh with actually getting me onto the, onto the spiritual path that I'm on right now. Um, not that he had any active part in it, he, but his words helped me to recognize the truth within myself. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. But anyway, one thing that he said uh, and I can't remember which volume, I think it was volume one of Conversations with God. Uh, he asks the question, this is a great question to ask yourself anytime you're about to make a decision. You just say, what would love do now? Yes, yes, yes. And that is a powerful, powerful question. If you can pause long enough to just ask the question, what would love do now? What happens is you just generally open up the space for love to come in and start filling that space and finding a way of, of, of bringing healing and compassion and forgiveness and gratitude and everything else into the picture. Absolutely. That's absolutely yeah. true. Because then we're not distracted, right? We're, we made a statement, what would love do now? And then universe is going to respond by giving possible scenarios. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe one scenario. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I know, speaking for myself again, in that space of being caught up in ego mind, which is often related to fear and anger and sadness and all those other emotions that you talked about. When I'm there in that ego mind, it's really hard to remember to ask the question. So it, it's, it's a constant, I won't say a struggle. It's a constant effort, I guess to remind myself to stay in that place of what would love do now and just keep asking that question. Just yes. keep asking it all day long. What would love do now? Yes. It's, it's a great very... mantra for meditation too. I have to keep that in mind. I, you know, 
we, I talked about choosing love over fear. Why would I choose right. love over fear? Well, with fear, I'm stuck in all the angst and unhappiness and violence of the world. I'm right. going to be there and I'm going to catch all the energy. But when I choose love, I'm hanging out in the fifth dimension. There are beautiful beings, there are beautiful possibilities. So right. why not choose to hang out with the, the great partners? Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's what they are, is, is really partners if we just give them a chance and listen quietly rather than talking all the time. Yes, we get so busy. So somebody might say to me, God doesn't listen to me. I said, well, really, God is always talking to you. You need to clear off your crown chakra and you know, just simplify it. And you can hear yeah. God then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned prayer earlier. And I think that uh, people in general have a very uh, strange idea of what prayer actually is. You know, prayer doesn't mean, hey, God, give me this. It's not about begging for something that you think you don't have. It's more, I think, it's more about communing, communing with God or spirit or universe or whatever you want to call it. It's about communing with that higher self, that divine being, and just simply being with it. And then, you know, I find it's more helpful to me when I am in this meditative prayer state not to say this is what i want but rather to say can you help me understand something mm -hmm. or can you show me how to get to the to the truth of this situation mm -hmm. because that's what god really is all about is truth and love and all these mm -hmm. things that you know we, we we list as higher values and then we think we only can attain them if God gives them to us. Well, we've already got them. Yes. <laughs> this is what people forget. So prayer is really about just sitting quietly and being present in that beautiful divine space and allowing divinity to commune back. I find it a great comfort. Right. And I, I walk around my apartment talking to God all day long. What do you think about this? Would you let me know all I need to know about this? Thank you so much for that. Thank you. you know, and so it's an ongoing uh, dialogue, which right. reinforces my knowledge that we are all connected. And what exactly I call it, right. I, mentioned, I mentioned in the book, it's an all-inclusive club. Right. Yeah, that, I mean, we are all one is not just a bumper sticker. It's, it's an absolute truth. Uh, and most people, you know, if you're stuck in your ego mind, you're not going to believe that that's just the way it is. But if you yeah. can get out of your ego mind and down into your heart and soul, you begin to realize that, that it is absolute truth. And this is the thing that we have to understand. We, we spend, I'd say most humans spend about 80 or 90% or, or more of their time in their ego space rather than in their spiritual space. And, um, mm -hmm. if, if we could just increase the amount of time we spend in our heart and soul, we would just make a huge difference in the world. Yes. We inspire one another, we affect one another, and that's right. the goal. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about this, this partnering idea that you, that you mentioned earlier on. Partnering and collaborating, I think you called it. So every day, we have the ability to choose compassion. That, that's the goal for me. We meet people and we, and we interact and we have reactions and we learn. We could go away, come away with thinking, oh, I said hello to Sue and I liked her dress, but there could be some other reason why Sue and I bumped into one another. And when, we're, when I'm stepping back and more aware of the partnering and the collaboration, I get to understand that more. Because universe is going to be there helping us because I'm asking for help, right? If, if I don't ask for help, if I don't want help, I'm not going to get too much. I'll get what I need, but I won't get as much as when I ask for help. 
So we have that capacity to, to meet our soulmate, to meet our, a person who's going to teach us something important if we look into it. And with that sense of adventure, the part, partnering and the collaboration have a very different energy. It's an energy, a soft energy, a loving energy. And then people come in, right? If I'm at a certain energy, I'm going to attract, remember, I'm a broadcast journalist. People are coming in because of my energy. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a very fertile thing to collaborate. So if I'm collaborating, I'm not telling people what to do. I'm respecting what they're doing and we're working together. And that's why I joined the food co-op way back sure. when, yeah. because I wanted the comfort of that collaboration. I don't know, sometimes when I smell coffee in the morning from somebody else's home or apartment, I feel such a sense, that olfactory sense, that it's a nurturing feeling and a sense that we're all connected and we're all getting up in the morning and going to start our day. All right. Mm -hmm. So collaboration is a higher, well, not, not that the universe would say higher is better, but it's a different energy than uh, is ordering something, ordering someone around. Mm -hmm. It's respecting each other and being around people who will uplift you so that you can collaborate. So collaboration is right. important for me, that people respect me because I'm going to respect them. Because I'm, yeah. I'm always, so another thing I wanted to say about my book that I hope connects with people is that I don't only share my successes, I share my failures as well. And I wonder if we have any time for me to read uh, two stories that you would know since you read the book about parking in a garage that had two different uh, happenings. Yeah, sure, absolutely, go ahead. <clears throat> So I'm saying that the failures can help uh, people as well. Well, if you think about it, I mean, what is a failure, but just uh, an awareness that this is not a way to do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Driving has been a source of adventure and challenge over the years. I rented a garage space that services 12 vehicles. Because of a narrow entry, I had to back into the space. One summer night after 10 p.m., a large private garbage truck followed me as I turned the corner onto my street. My goal was to stop on the left of the street to then back up and into my car stall, an unusual entry that I've never quite enjoyed in the 19 years of my residency in this covered carport. So I stopped on the left as I planned, opened the garage door, the garbage truck truck stopped two right behind me. Only as I backed up, the driver wouldn't budge to allow me the space I needed. I tried once more with the same result. On some level, I was afraid because of the late hour and because the driver could not be seen. Intimidated as I was, it was necessary for me to get out of my car on the dark, quiet street. I needed to ask for the driver's help. I reached past fear into my heart, smiled and motioned to him. Through my speaking and gesturing, he understood what I needed to do and he backed up, giving me the required space. I felt such a relief. As he drove off, we waved goodbye like friends who had just completed a task. I felt grateful for his cooperation, which reminded me that we have the ability to make space for the other negotiating the many situations we encounter. We can make life easier, stretching to communicate and accommodate. As the driver and I demonstrated that evening, he became more flexible and I more compassionate, a most pragmatic transition. My next example at the same garage had the opposite effect. Before getting to the garage, I had attended a dinner party where one guest aggressively to win a point, maintained a position that denied a personal stance of mine. 
I gently gave this person examples of ways in which I've balanced my values in a nuanced way, yet this person was unrelenting and wouldn't acknowledge these subtleties. I hadn't realized how blocked I felt about this disregard for my sensibility until I got to the same garage at around the same time of night where a car was parked directly in front of the entrance. I pulled up alongside of his car. The driver, a middle-aged man, was slow to advance once I gestured that I needed him to move. He pulled up and I didn't think he left me enough room to back up. I flicked my low beam lights repeatedly in the effort to have him pull up further. My anger was palpable. He didn't budge or say anything as I continued to flick my lights. He put on his hazards. I felt the anger with each depress of my light lever. I finally caught myself, took a breath, reevaluating the distance I needed to back into my garage, and I successfully drove into my stall. I have had felt blocked by the dinner guest as well as the driver. This burst of negativity surprised me and seemed to come out of nowhere. There it had been lurking, into my lurking in my unconscious. Each cell in my body was charged with anger and my energy radiated negativity. Once I understood my feelings, I was able to breathe and calm myself. I acted differently in these two similar situations. I was calm and resilient in my response to the driver in the private garbage truck. Not so in the, act in the interaction with the man whose car blocked my entrance to the garage. Why? In this situation, lurking in my unconscious was the anger I hadn't consciously recognized. And this unknowingness sabotaged my ability to be compassionate. This example demonstrates the power of the unconscious mind to motivate our behavior and the importance of bringing the unconscious mind into conscious thinking. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. That does yeah. really tell a great story. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're almost up to the top of the hour here. I wanted to ask, do you have any final words you'd like to share before I close us out for today? Think of, let's think of ourselves on a spiritual path and the adventure of that spiritual path and the prize that awaits as we show love and receive love and become an inspiration to those who see us, remembering that an inspired life moves others. Wow, that is so true. and and. Absolutely beautiful. Linda, thank you so much for being here today. It's been a real pleasure sharing space with you and learning more about your journey and about this great book, uh, which, by the way, it, do you have a, a, I know it's on it's on Amazon, right? People can find this book. It's on Amazon. And there's also a quick link, theatrainbook.com brings you right there. But but if you go Let on me Amazon. Let me put that in. So I want to okay. make sure I get this right. So this is the direct you, link Julia. right here to this is the direct link to the Amazon page where uh, the book is located. Um, I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of this book. It's really, really awesome. Uh, not that long, about 150 pages, 160 pages, something like that. And a, a pretty easy read, lots of great stuff in it. Something that you can um, read, you know, over a few nights as you're getting ready for bed. It's a beautiful, beautiful way to close out your night. So anyway, thank you again, Linda, for being here. And I just want to say to you folks, you know, ultimately the A Train to Sedona is about remembering your inherent power to manifest desires constructively and choose love over fear. Linda's triumphant message is that by looking inward and connecting to inner wisdom, anyone can co-create the life they desire through their partnership with the divine. So thank you all for watching today's program. Uh, and remember, you can catch recordings of this and every other episode on my website at lifemasterytv.com. David, friends, thank I you so much. Mike. I'm sorry, thank go ahead. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah, you're most welcome. Friends, I just want to say, I invite you to remember to practice my Life Mastery mantra every day. It goes like this. I gratefully forgive the imperfect being I have been in the past. 
I gratefully accept the magnificent being I am right now. I gratefully welcome the evolved being I am becoming in each new moment. So until we meet again, my name is David McLeod, your Life Mastery Coach, wishing you love, light, and blessings. I'll see you next time on Life Mastery TV. Bye-bye.